Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing a very interesting resolution to a somewhat interesting mystery in regards to extremely ancient stars, with some stars being potentially older than the universe itself, or at least it seemed that way. And all of this is going to be based on this relatively recent study that as always you can find in the description below, that was able to identify very specific objects somewhere out there in our galaxy, several different objects, that seem to explain how such unusual stars are created and why they seem to exist to begin with. But first let's actually identify what this unusual mystery was up until now. So obviously in the last few decades we've discovered quite a lot of different stars, and for every typical star we've discovered there's always some unusual exception to the rule or some star that just doesn't make sense. In this particular case, some of these stars happen to be white dwarfs. Now we generally understand how white dwarfs are formed. For example, a star like our sun, or actually 97% of all of the stars in our galaxy, once they get old enough and once they lose their outer shell, will end up as a typical white dwarf, which represents a kind of a leftover or a core of an ancient star, mostly made out of what's known as the degenerate matter. It's basically made out of a lot of electrons condensed in an extremely small space, with some of the other particles moving here and there as well, producing the total mass of this object. We've discussed this in some of the previous videos on white dwarfs. In general though, white dwarfs tend to also be around a very similar mass. Usually, on average, they're about 0.6 masses of our own sun, and that's because for a white dwarf of this mass to be produced, the star has to be a little bit more massive than the sun and obviously has to live out its life that's usually around a few billion years. So for example, for our own sun, that's actually going to be over 12 billion years old when it turns into a white dwarf, it's going to produce an object that's about 0.6 masses of the sun as well. With some of the other well-known white dwarfs, such as the closest one to us, Sirius B that you see being pointed at right here, being even more massive, closer to approximately one mass of the Sun. And that of course means that the original star was much more massive and was very likely closer to about three to four masses of the Sun before it turned into a white dwarf, which also means that it most likely lived much less, probably only four to five billion years. And that's the general relationship here. The more massive the white dwarf, the more massive was the progenitor star and the less lifetime it probably had and vice versa. If you find a very small white dwarf, it means that the original star was probably extremely long-lived. Which creates a bit of a problem, because we've actually found quite a few of these really low-mass white dwarfs that currently do not make sense. As a matter of fact, and not so long ago, the scientists have even discovered a white dwarf that was only about 15% the mass of the sun. And for this type of an object to really exist, in theory the original star would have to also live for possibly hundreds of billions of years, if not a trillion years. Which obviously does not add up with our calculations for the total age of the universe, which is currently at around 13.8 billion years. And so that's basically the mystery. How could such unusually low mass white dwarfs exist? Now the proposition a few years ago, or actually closer to like a few decades ago, was that well maybe they're all part of what's known as the cataclysmic variable. Essentially a binary system where one star steals the mass from the other. And in this case it's the white dwarf that gets its mass stolen, thus decreasing in mass and increasing in size. And specifically here you would have to have another object, such as for example a neutron star, stealing the mass from the white dwarf itself. Now that was the proposition and that was the theory, but it was very hypothetical and did not really explain some of the other white dwarfs and specifically some of the other systems that did not really have a neutron star or did not have a black hole to steal the mass from the white dwarf. Nevertheless, the assumption was still there and it just required some sort of a proof. It required a proof for the existence of these three extremely low mass dwarfs, or ELM white dwarfs as they're also known. And that's pretty much exactly what this new paper is about. It's an official discovery of several of these pre-ELM white dwarfs that explain how they're made and sort of solve the mystery of these extremely or potentially extremely ancient stars. They're not ancient at all, they just basically lost some of their mass because of their partner. But to get all of these pre-ELM white dwarfs, the scientists had to go through roughly around 1 billion different candidates or essentially search the catalog of 1 billion different stars in the Gaia catalog that's publicly available. Out of this billion stars, they were able to discover roughly around 50 potential candidates, and in those 50 candidates, 
They did a direct observation and a follow-up on 21 of these objects, with all of them turning out to be these unusual formations. Now, why is it 21 out of so many different stars? Well, it's most likely because this is an extremely short process. Or basically, this is just a transition stage that happens extremely quickly, and we simply just got lucky seeing some of them in that particular transition stage. But in this particular case, it's actually a discovery of a completely new population of a specific transitional binary stars that seem to always end up producing these low-mass dwarfs. But in order to be this low-mass white dwarf, the white dwarf has to be roughly around 30% the mass of our sun, or even less. Anything over that mass usually can be explained using modern physics without really needing to have any unusual star formations. But in order for this ELM to be produced in this way, or basically in order for the mass to be stolen from the white dwarf, this particular object, the white dwarf, cannot actually be denser than the star itself. Because of the density, normally the matter is going to be flowing away from the low dense object into the high dense object, or the white dwarf. Which is why usually in these formations known as cataclysmic variable stars, you will have a low dense and a high dense object, and the high density object is the one that's stealing all of the mass. So for white dwarfs, this has to be something that's a little bit more dense than them. And for white dwarfs, it means two things. It has to be either a neutron star, a black hole, or potentially another white dwarf that's slightly more massive and thus a little bit more dense. And that's pretty much exactly what the scientists have discovered. They've discovered a few of these white dwarfs that were way, way more poofed up and bloated, and seem to also be somewhat egg-shaped because of the interaction with the object that's a little bit more dense and is still in their matter. But in this case, this right here is that white dwarf. This is the low-mass white dwarf that's essentially losing a lot of its mass and is turning into something a little bit different. In this case, it's not an ELM just yet. It's what the scientists in this paper refer to as the pre-ELM white dwarf. But that's obviously not a very catchy name, so I'm sure in the future someone will propose a much better name for these unusual transition stages. But more importantly, the scientists have identified 21 of these objects, meaning that it's something that seems to be an explanation for how the white dwarfs will turn into low-mass white dwarfs, and what exactly actually happens to them, both physically in terms of appearance, and of course morphologically in terms of the actual shape of the star. And from the objects discovered, 13 of them were still actually actively losing their mass to their partner star whereas the other eight seem to have just stopped transferring mass and have sort of started to transform into something else, very likely changing their shape once again and thus beginning a transformation into an actual low-mass white dwarf. With most of these objects discovered also being extremely hot, nearly 8000 Kelvin, but at the same time some of these objects also appear detached where the mass transfer sort of stopped. And in this case, the scientists believe that because of extremely high temperatures, this causes what's known as magnetic breaking, where it basically breaks apart this transfer of mass because the high temperature prevents some of the magnetic forces from allowing the mass to transfer effectively. And so with some of these hot objects, they very likely just completely stop transferring mass and start transforming into something different a little bit early on. But the most important discovery is of course the fact that these objects were even found. It's an important evolutionary link when it comes to star transformation and explains one of the bigger mysteries without needing to have any exotic explanations. But in their paper, the scientists also mentioned that, well, if it wasn't for the availability of all of this data, this would never be even possible. Specifically, the data created by all of the teams in the ZTF or Zwicky Transient Facility and the data from the Gaia Telescope that's been sort of mapping the entire galaxy or really the entire universe for the past few years. And so all of these incredible recent discoveries are really because of the availability of all of this data, which makes it relatively easy for a lot of scientists to then try to combine this, discovering something really cool in the process. Which of course means that we'll be talking about more discoveries in some of the future videos as well, so make sure to subscribe and maybe share this video with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. Anyway, on that note, all of the links are in the description below. And thank you so much for watching, thank you for all of your support, and if you'd like to help this channel grow more, check out the Patreon page, or maybe join the channel membership, or potentially buy the Wonderful Person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.